Today we're diving into symptomatic hyponatremia, focusing on why it can be deadly including cerebral swelling and seizures. We'll also discuss the critical steps to safely replace sodium and avoid the devastating complications of osmotic demyelination syndrome. This is going to be essential knowledge for new ER nurses. Let's get started. Let's start with the basics. Hyponatremia occurs when serum sodium levels drop below 135, with normal levels ranging from 135 to 145. Sodium is essential for maintaining water balance, proper nerve function, and muscle contractions. When levels fall below 120, the condition becomes critical and potentially life-threatening. While the exact danger threshold depends on the individual and how quickly the sodium drops, severe hyponatremia can lead to devastating complications. Hyponatremia becomes deadly due to its profound impact on the brain and other vital systems. Cerebral edema occurs when low sodium causes water to shift into brain cells, leading to the brain swelling. This swelling increases the intracranial pressure within the skull, leading to reduced blood flow and oxygen delivery, leading to seizures, altered mentation, and the risk of irreversible brain damage. Sodium is critical for muscle and nerve function, so severe hyponatremia can disrupt also the heart's electrical activity, leading to arrhythmias and impair the respiratory muscles, causing respiratory failure. This cascade of life-threatening events highlights why timely intervention is critical. Although it's not caused by hyponatremia itself, osmotic demyelination syndrome, or ODS, is a critical complication to be aware of when managing this condition. ODS occurs when sodium levels are corrected too quickly, leading to damage to the brain cells, a process called demyelination. This can cause permanent neurological damage and can lead to death. We'll go into more detail about ODS later in the video, but for now, it's important to understand that while correcting sodium is crucial, doing it too rapidly can lead to severe consequences. Hyponatremia can result from a variety of causes, broadly categorized into excess water retention or intake or sodium loss. In the elderly, one of the more common causes is the medications they are on. In cases of excess water retention, conditions like SIADH, congestive heart failure, cirrhosis, and renal failure can cause the body to hold onto water, diluting sodium levels. Polydipsia or excess water intake can overwhelm the body's inability to maintain the, the balance as well. And then sodium loss is another key contributor, often seen with thiazide diuretics, vomiting, diarrhea, excessive sweating without sodium replacement. There's other causes like Addison's disease, taking antidepressants, inappropriate use of hypotonic IV fluids, and many others. Hyponatremia presents with a range of symptoms depending on its severity. In mild to moderate cases, patients may experience confusion or altered mental status, muscle weakness or cramps, and fatigue. However, in severe hyponatremia, symptoms can escalate dramatically and include seizures, arrhythmias, and signs of brain damage such as decreased level of consciousness. The treatment of hyponatremia focuses on three key goals, addressing the underlying cause, restoring sodium balance, and avoiding serious complications like cerebral swelling and osmotic demyelination syndrome. In mild cases where the patient is not symptomatic, treatment is typically conservative. This may involve the use of sodium pills to gently raise sodium levels and water restrictions to limit fluid intake, allowing the body to regain balance naturally. For more severe or symptomatic cases, we'll discuss specific interventions in the next slides. When a patient is critical and symptomatic, such as presenting with seizures or a decreased level of consciousness, the primary goal is to raise sodium levels just enough to reduce these life-threatening symptoms. However, this must be done carefully to avoid rapid overcorrection, which can lead to osmotic demyelination syndrome. To alleviate these severe symptoms, often only a small rise in sodium is needed. Typically, the target is to raise serum sodium by four to six within the first six hours. Again, this is often enough to alleviate acute symptoms, just a tiny bit of an increase. Beyond that, the total increase should be limited to eight to 10 in 24 hours overall to ensure that, the, that there is safe correction and minimize the risk of those complications we've talked about. Again, if symptomatic, if severely symptomatic, a small increase of four to six within six hours is often enough to help alleviate these acute symptoms. Again, the seizures being altered, decreased mentation. These, then within the 24 hours, the sodium level as a whole should not be raised by more than 10. We ensure to raise the sodium level very slowly again to avoid ODS. But again, just wanted to make sure that you understand that if the patient's symptomatic, a very small increase is often all it takes for the symptoms to subside. Only a increase of a 4.6 sodium would be enough again to alle alleviate more uh, most of these symptoms. And then within those 24 hours, you do not want to raise it by more than 10 because again, we want to avoid leading to ODS.
Now, in the ER, raising sodium levels is, in critical cases typically involves the use of 3% hypertonic saline. The standard protocol starts with an initial bolus of 100 ml over 10 minutes, which can be repeated up to three times if symptoms persist. Each 100 ml bolus increases serum sodium by approximately 2 MEQs, making it highly effective in stabilizing patients. But what if your ER doesn't have 3% saline readily available and waiting for pharmacy would take too long? In these cases, the provider may opt to administer 1 to 2 amps of sodium bicarbonate. Each amp increases sodium by about 1 to 2 MEQs, offering a quick temporary solution while waiting for the hypertonic saline to arrive. And as you know, the sodium bicarbonate amps are readily available in all ERs. Before we move on, let's touch on the difference between hypovolemic, euvolemic, and hypervolemic hyponatremia. In hypovolemic hyponatremia, the, off the body has decreased fluid volume and low sodium, often due to vomiting or diarrhea. The treatment here is administration of normal saline, 0.9%, which restores the lost fluid volume and provides sodium as well, as normal saline contains a sodium concentration of 154. On the other hand, if it's euvolemic or hypervolemic hyponatremia, the focus shifts to fluid restriction, possible use of diuretics, and addressing the underlying cause. For example, if the issue is SIADH, treatment will target that specifically to resolve the water and sodium imbalance. And by the way, if you're finding this helpful and want to save time and energy with mastering the chaos of the ER, check out our book and our course. They are packed with everything you need, including foundational material, quizzes, and practical tips to help you feel confident and, and ready for the ER. You can join the channel as a member as well and gain access to the course by clicking the join button. You can find the links in the pinned comment or in the description text below. Now. As a nurse, your role during symptomatic hyponatremia treatment is crucial. Frequent sodium checks are essential, with labs typically being drawn every two to four hours initially so we can keep a very close eye on how fast we're raising the sodium, and then every four hours for patients who are started on a sodium infusion. Always remember to avoid drawing labs from the same line infusing the 3% saline to prevent a false high result, right? Next, neurological monitoring is equally as important. Keep a close eye on the patient for improvements in symptoms like the confusion is improving, the patient is not having seizure anymore, the patient is not altered anymore, because this will let us know that our interventions are working and that we can perhaps not be as aggressive anymore. And then don't forget to have seizure pads on your hyponatremic patients because they could seize. Now, preventing overcorrection is key to avoiding complications like osmotic demyelination syndrome. It's important to remember that once the symptoms improve, the infusion rate may need to be slowed or completely stopped. If sodium levels rise too quickly, interventions like administering D5W uh, or desmopressin can help. So desmopressin is a synthetic analog of ADH that reduces urine output by promoting water reabsorption in the kidneys. Um, this helps counter act the rapid sodium increases. Similarly, D5W is a hypotonic fluid that dilutes sodium concentration by increasing total body water, effectively slowing the rise in sodium. Now, osmotic demyelination syndrome, or ODS, is a serious and potentially irreversible neurologic condition caused by rapid sodium correction, particularly in patients with chronic hyponatremia. The rapid increase in sodium levels damage the protective myelin sheaths of neurons. ODS can cause a wide range of symptoms, from neurological uh, symptoms including difficulty speaking, difficulty swallowing, and weakness or paralysis, particularly in the arms and legs. And in the most severe form, ODS can result in locked-in syndrome, a devastating condition where the patient is fully conscious but unable to move any part of the body except their eyes. And without intervention, this can even progress to death. This is why it is very important that when it comes to, with, to hyponatremia, if the patient is severely symptomatic, such as having seizures, just raising it enough is often enough to alleviate these acute symptoms. But then once doing that, the replacement needs to be very slow. Again, no more than 10 MEQ um, per, per 24 hours to avoid these complications. And as always, teamwork makes the dream work. And here at Emergency Chaos, we are proactive, not reactive.